Hello, everybody. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was very exciting. Hello. Oh, exciting. It's, it's Welcome Nancy to Prey Drive. Yes. Yep, it is. Welcome to Prey Drive. Go ahead, Nancy. <laughs> Uh, hi everybody. It's I'm Nancy, and I'm on uh, I'm the little icon. I'm on the road, so uh, I can talk and drive, but I can't look at the camera and drive. So I am uh, I will be around, and I'll be able to listen in and answer any questions. But uh, Joanne and uh, Lisa are driving the bus today on Parade Drive. So yeah, hi Sue, your, your little avatar. Talks. I know flashes talk. when I talk. That's so. cool. That's cool. All right. I'm Joanne Soiki with For Better or For Worse. <laughs> and Lisa Batasco with Canine Defined. All right. All right. Today we're going to talk about uh, Prey Drive, what it is and what it isn't. Because um, a lot of people think that because of dogs like to chase things, that they have Prey Drive. So we want to kind of talk about specifically what it is and what it isn't, as well as kind of how to work with a dog that does maybe have um, you know, a little bit more uh, prey drive uh, in their in their DNA, right? Um, so, prey drive is is very different from chasing things. Usually, prey drive means that the dog wants to eat whatever it's chasing, right? Uh, it's not it, it's for survival, not for not a social issue like aggression. So, a lot of people. Uh, they use the prey drive and aggression interchangeably, and it's not. Prey drive is a, it's a genetic thing, and uh, the aggression is a, 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 yes, right. Right. So, um, sure. yep. So it's what it's a it's a different goal, and it looks very different when a dog is motivated by prey drive versus just likes to chase stuff. Uh, I have uh, personally had. A little um, one of my min pins um, had um, quite a bit of prey drive, um, and which resulted in that behavior coming out and chasing cars. So, and she would stalk things, and so it was a real different versus my lab that and lab and shepherd that enjoy chasing things, but they don't have a lot of prey drive. Even though my shepherd exhibits it more, um, it's not uh, not not a lot. Thank goodness. <laughs> So. Yeah, and I know the thing that I always found one of the most interesting pieces of it is some dogs really enjoy the hunt and the chase, but they don't actually go for the end kill, right? Um, which I always like to say, it's not the art of chasing things, but it's if you ever go to a lure coursing trial or a fast cat or anything like that, right? It's, it's not 100%, but... Um, you can sort of see those dogs like when they get to the bags at the end, whether or not they'd kill something, <laughs> right? <clears throat> so whether they stop yes. and stare at it once it stops moving or they pick up those bags and rip the, the, the string and, yep. Lisa, what were you going to say? Um, no, I, I think that, um, I know Nancy had put a little um, uh, um, PowerPoint presentation together. I'm going to go ahead and put it on. Bear with me a second because... I had it too, so. Did you? Yep. I sent it to both of you just in case. <laughs> oh, stop. Hold on, hold on. I'm sharing my screen. You're not, though. I know I'm not. I'm trying to find it, what I'm looking for. I, do you want me to share? As you're looking, as you're looking for it, so I'm going to tell you, uh, and Joanne brings up a, a, a memory, a memory that I have. Uh, that I took my little mint pin Lucy, and I, I don't know if Lisa, you had gone with us, and we were, she was doing lure, lure courses, yes. and she, she did ended up catching the little, and it was, they were using actually fur uh, for that, and she, it took almost 10 minutes to get her to let the little piece of fur go. <laughs> so, no so funny she, for her. Uh, yeah, so she was pretty serious about catching and killing it. Uh, however, that is what they were bred to do, right? They're ratters. So uh, she very much uh, was in tune with her self uh, <laughs> on that. So she just, uh, Joanne just made me remember that, think about that. Versus my other min pin, Elvis, was like, yeah, I don't, 
I'm not chasing that. And I don't really care about catching it. So there you go. <laughs> so. Oh, yes. Hold on. Let me see if I can. Can you see it? Um, can I? No. No. I see your screen, but not your, not the presentation. Yeah, I don't. Okay. Let's do. Oh, duh. It's in the pool. Window. Here we go. I got it. You got it. How about now? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Got so it. do the slide. So play the. So play the slideshow. Well, it doesn't matter. It's fine. Um. I think too. A lot of times, like Prey Drive, you have to remember if you go a little further down, it goes into the sequence of it. And I think you need to consider the sequence. And remember, all dogs were designed for a specific task. And so when you look at the various types of um, breeds or, you know, what have you, like the herding breed or the bully breeds or what have you, um, they are more honed to a specific job. So what happens is that they, we've genetically, we've selected for specific things. So um, a muted, so we want heavy eye and oriented on the border collies and then a stalk, but they need interruption in some of that because you gotta be careful to guide them and all that fun stuff. So, whereas if you have a border collie that does a grab bite um, and a kill bite, that type of thing, that that's not so great for, for being in, um, a environment where you're moving cattle and or sheep and stuff. So I think um, you want to pay attention to where it is in that predatory sequence based upon the breed, um, what what they're designed to do and so forth. So like bird dogs, right? So Duane can probably speak to like the bichlas and you know the setters and all that fun stuff. I mean they do heavy stalking, mm -hmm. right? Heavy stalking. Um, and then, and they even are super slow. And if you've seen it super exaggerated, I remember whose dog was it? I think it was um, Aaron's dog, but no, it was Melanie's dog that was pointing out yeah. order years ago yeah. when yeah. she started doing nose work and stuff. I'm like, she's pointing. It was so crazy cool yeah. to see some of that. Yeah. But go ahead. I'm sorry. So Tana says, you mean they're not supposed, no, retrievers are supposed to have a soft mouth and one of the, one of the uh, one of the predatory sequence uh, exaggerated in Golden's is Chase, um, which, which is why they're great retrievers and all that. But yeah, ideally you don't want them to grab them out of the air and eat them. But uh, you know, <laughs> yes. And truly, when you're breeding the hunting dogs, right? Part of that retrieve is if I'm going to eat the meats, I actually want it to be nice meat when it comes back to me. So like rib cages should remain intact, <laughs> right? So you don't want the dog that gives the big crunch down on the bird. Yeah, and, and you know, and then you wanna look at some of the other, like the terriers, what they were designed to do, right? And then there's crossover between some of the breeds depending on the job that they're supposed to do. Like for example, with the terriers, they are very tenacious. They're, um, I think somebody told me that they were, um, they were, they were like fight club dogs, right? <laughs> Where they get the dopamine out of actually that particular, um the, the actual fight so the 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 orient is there but then the eye and the stock is kind of muted and then they go right into taking space and moving forward on it so you know and then getting and doing the and doing the bite yes the terriers that's what they do right right and that's what i think we don't understand uh, people don't understand that you know there are aspects of this that genetically we're not going to fix or change you know, there are things that are important about um, understanding who the dog is and then how to change work some of that, which we'll get into a little further in. Yeah. So it's one of those things that, um, you know, I can't tell you how many calls. And I think Lisa and Joanne have probably also gotten in. You know, I have a, a border collier in Aussie who nips the children. Well, you know, it's not aggression. It's they're bred to herd. And some of them, like Lisa said, ideally you want a dog that's got some good eye stock, you know, eye and stocking and orientation, but not so much the nipping, you know right. what I mean? To be able to make, do their job. But, but you I, know, with gen genetics is tricky though at times, you know, with that. Go ahead. Remember it's an instinct. And when um, it's an, it's an intrinsic instinct for the dogs. So when they do this, 
they are getting um, just flashes of dopamine, the feel good hormone, and then also your adrenaline, right? So it's increasing blood flow. So it's very um, self reinforcing and they don't have it's when it's instinctual like that. It's not something that we can change. It's a way that we have to figure it out. And depending on the breed, you have to determine where, where to interrupt that behavior depending on what's happening and so forth. So like for the bully breeds, for example, if you see them orient, you need to interrupt some of that stuff. So you need to train, work some of that behavior beforehand versus allowing them to rehearse what you don't want. And because their, their um, stalk, eye and stalk is so muted, you know, they go right into altercations. They're kind of like, woohoo, let's go in and do this. I don't know what's happening, but it's almost like that dopamine comes in for just the fight itself. So, you know, and again, this is very like for the border collies, it's really very um, um, just self satisfying to do the stalking and, and all that fun stuff. So, you know, know who your dog is and all that. I mean, when we get to the kill bright, kill bite and grab bite, those kinds of things are you know, more concerning. Um, I get calls, I know, Joanne, you probably have gotten calls too, like about, I remember I do at the shelter, we do, um, we'll do dog to dog meets. And there was one lady that brought in her dog and the dog just crouched down immediately. And I was like, it's got herding breed, doesn't it? So, and of course it did. So it crouched and watched the other dog and stuff like that. And I'm like, just interrupt the behavior and try to get them off. But they're like, this is how they always greet dogs. And I'm like, well, you didn't do a very good job helping that, <laughs> right? You could have interrupted some of this and not allowed it because other dogs will start to give out different signals to kind of, you know, bring the, the pressure down or the situation down so that the dogs aren't going to start some type of altercation. And the, and the life, likewise, too, when dogs interact with each other, they're very different in terms of what they were designed to do. So you know, I mean, we're kind of getting off the subject here, but, but the whole point is, is you need to be aware of what your dog was designed to do, period. Right. And I mean, just throwing it out there that again, that's a whole other Facebook live, but you know, Lisa kind of touched on it, right? These are things that are ingrained in the dog. You, you can assist and help and give the dog other things to do but if you really truly try to inhibit these behaviors they will manifest themselves in other ways right 100%. so this is sort of where you know you have people who use real aversive methods on the herding breeds right they'll come out they they will stop stalking and they'll just nail you you know what i mean so um just think about that right when when you have an animal that is designed and bred to do a job and you try and say don't do that job it's very frustrating for the animal mm -hmm. So. That's absolutely true, and and that's what a lot of people do, right? And it and and uh, Joanne hit it on the head. It will manifest somewhere else, and it's and sometimes it's worse than just trying to work with the behavior you've got, right? right. So, um, so it's really important, and that and this is it goes to a, a, as Lisa said to another whole selection process, but this is why you really want to think about the breed that you want to bring into your home as your pet and what are some of those things it's not good or bad it's just that these are some things you need to consider um, if you want to bring a certain breed at home or a certain type of dog home like for example if you enjoy breeding rats bringing a terrier into that house is going to be tough right right and it's the terrier. Be a <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> for everyone involved right. it's going to be a problem right or if you have a lot of small children or a really busy house a herding breed might be tougher i mean it's a lot it of might visual be a, stimulus. A, a lot of visual stimulus and it might be tough so that's what one of the reasons we do these facebook lives is to have you think about that like okay my lifestyle is such and this is what this this dog would fit where this month may not right and that's right. kind of how you want to think about it so that then you can make a, a, a selection based on what your lifestyle is so that you and the dog and whoever else has to deal with the dog are going to be in a much better place, right? Um, 
And then, uh, well, Stephanie, we'll come back to her question in a minute as we get into outlets for prey drive and stuff. But Deb Plowman asked about how mixed breeds are affected by prey drive and instinct. Is a behavior diluted, for example, a doodle and herding breed? No, not necessarily. So I've been um, doing this program. It's a really cool program and learning more about the genetic and the ethology and combining all the sciences because everybody has a different lens when they look at dogs in terms of training and working with them or who they are. Um, and one of the things that was said was that when you do your wisdom panels or you check who your dog is, a uh, 30% or more, that, that is qual that's, qual that's important information, right? Because that'll tell you more about who the dog is. So if you have these mixed breeds and anything, anything under 30%, it's just, it has very little effect or um, influence over the dog's behavior. So when you're looking at that, I think it totally depends on what your percentages are and then you can kind of identify possibilities. But of course, anytime you run gen, you know, genetics, I mean, the best of people who breed dogs, they're trying to breed for specific things. So like, you know, we talk about like, um, I have Aussies, the mini Aussies, and the minis were the line that I got them from was more uh, Frisbee and they needed full body contact. They have to be super good with people and so forth. And so that actually, um, um, that was important in terms of how to um, to know what to select for, right? So when I was breeding two, if you're breeding two dogs and you have one dog who's a little more sociable, but likes the social contact and the kinesthetic and stuff, and you try to put them together with another dog who has something else, genes, the genetics gonna decide. I mean, truly, let's be honest, if, if nature had her way, none of these dogs would be around because none of them could function in life. I mean, truly, because when you put this into nature, what happens is um, nature selects for not, not confrontation, but here we are selecting for these things and kind of making anomalies of our dogs. And then we find trouble for it. So it opens a whole nother can of worms, but it's just information about who that dog is. So to answer your question, I would look at anything above 30% 30 or more and kind of look at who those breeds are in terms of their prey drive if you're concerned about that. Um, what else? Where are you? Where are you? So I can't see any questions because I have the presentation. Okay. So, um, so the pr uh, for how to, how to work with a high drive dog, um, management prevention, channeling prey drive, self-control and reliable recall. So I think um, you need an outlet like Joanne was talking about and Nancy was talking about, definitely need um, an outlet for them and then some management, but then also understanding your prey sequence because uh, if I allowed my terrier to get orient, then all of a sudden I have maybe not even a second to interrupt that behavior and then they're pew off, right? Woo let me go at it jump in and deal with it later so um anyway but go ahead yeah else? i yeah. mean well, one of the ahead, one please. of the things about about go ahead joanne no, no go ahead i think go with ahead. management it, it's basically so with management i think you have you have you know managing is not allowing your dogs to practice the behavior you don't want for example if you have a border collie you don't want them practicing nipping the children so make sure that, that you, you prevent that behavior as you are then redirecting their behavior to do what you want or and giving them an outlet for that behavior, right? So it's really important because people, I, I, we're getting more and more people that are allowing their dogs to practice the bad behavior, but yet in the, while they're trying to stop it, you cannot do, you, you cannot let them be practicing the behavior and then try to interrupt it or stop it. It's really, you can't, it, it, it's 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 really 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 difficult to do that you have to really not allow them as much as you can not to practice that behavior um so that they can uh so you can uh train it and, and work on it right yeah and i think too like to me the management and prevention is on top for a reason right um it's just like nancy said right the, the, when you're struggling with something and you even take prey drive out of it, right? Let's say you're struggling with your dogs jumping on the counters, right? Every time they jump up there and get something, that's way more valuable to them than the 17 times you gave them a cookie for naught, right? So that's just something that they want. That's just food. Think about these things that are just ingrained into who they are, their core being, right? So 
I think you want to be really careful when we talk about management and prevention. And, you know, I'm just using the border collie herding scenario because that seems easy, right? So, like, no, I don't let them out when the kids have friends over and they're all running around the backyard. So I'm stopping that from happening. But, you know, every night my husband takes his slippers off and he, he plays the foot game and lets the dog nail him in the foot, right? It's like, okay, so that's part of the, that whole process, right? So you have to you have to sort of prevent all the things that are focusing the dog on human feet, right? And then I think too, like that channeling piece of it, make sure that you're putting it towards good right. and not evil, right? right. So like, <laughs> yes, you know, channel the forces for good, not evil. Right. <laughs> yes, for sure. So, you know, something like that if your dog really does have a good prey drive something like fast cat right where it's a plastic bag it's unlikely to be in your area you know it's going fast in a straight line it's set up in a certain way um you know things like toys and and games that you can play that way but it's it's hard to channel it without the self-control piece that's underneath of it right because what you'll see, we have some videos here, but I mean, some of what you see is these dogs get so aroused yes. and amped up, right? It's it's like they have no self-control. And then when they have no self-control because their arousal's through the roof, the recall, they can't even hear you calling them, right. right? So it's not just one of these things. You have to put all of them together to really find success in trying to deal with these dogs that, that really just have this this high drive to do things. So, and, and the thing is, the reason why they get, again, it becomes, um, it's kind of like the cats and laser lights or people play laser, the laser games with their dogs and stuff like that. Remember, it is releasing that, that ability, that natural instinct is highly reinforcing because it releases dopamine and it can create an addict. So that's why it can be so dangerous. So, and I think, again, they go into this level of arousal where they are gone because they are too high on their dopamine and their adrenaline and so forth that they are not paying attention to anything. So, um, but yes, management prevention is super important on channeling your prey drive. Obviously, um, you know, I guess like, I'm one of those people who are like, I don't like the dog staring a lot, right? And because all of a sudden you're like, that's a little bit too long. I want them to be able to split attention. I think it's why most of us will do the auto check-in where it's unprompted, unsolicited, and they offer eye contact so they can split their attention. And um, I think um, we start there, right? Because it is a relationship issue. Then you have to find the proper outlets, which is what Stephanie was, was talking about. As far as uh, enrichment and all that, we can talk about other things to do which kind of falls into suit with the self-control and playing and all that. Um, so I think it's, uh, I think we don't we, remember, I don't know, I don't know, Nancy, do you remember that gentleman? There was a gentleman one time, it was a, it was a case where the little terrier was at the window and was barking at the window. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. We're running back and forth. Talk about reinforcing behavior. He, he was, well, what did you do? He said he, he opened the door and let the dog chase oh the Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yes. And that was time, and time again. And yeah, so, so that was a, yeah, that was a very, yeah, that was a, the dog was like barking and throwing himself at the window and all that. And he said he does, he was doing this all the time. So I asked him, I said, so what do you do when he does that? Oh, I opened the door and let him out. So yeah, <laughs> it's like, it's like, woohoo. <laughs> it's like you get reinforced for that behavior. So sometimes we inadvertently reinforce things that we really should be. Right. Or that we really don't think, we don't think that we would, right? You should start that so, bank accounts for the window replacement here shortly too, just so you know. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, um, and uh, yeah, this was quite a long time ago, but yeah, yeah. that was, it was interesting. Um, there's a question here or a comment from Lynn Jeffers. Um, I got a foster dog yesterday, BC Lab Mix. He had been roaming stray. The previous foster said he had a strong prey drive, stalking and wanted to chase squirrels, rabbits, deer. I've seen him interested in squirrels and bunnies in the neighborhood. Unfortunately, he found a bunny nest in the yard and pulled a couple babies out. However, he didn't try to kill or eat it. So this isn't really prey drive. Well, it's a prey, right. it's a prey sequence. Right. But if he's got BC and lab in him, I would be 
I would be a little disappointed if he killed the bunnies, right? I mean, he should have a soft mouth if he's BC, I'm sorry, lab, and then the BC, depending on which one is more or less. So, I mean, I guess, Lynn, you've learned something about him that he'll chase it because it's exciting to chase, but not necessarily um, as reinforcing to grab, shake, kill. Yeah, because it stops the movement, the running part. Right. Right. Um, um, so I see this thing from Allie. Wow, that's a really sad thing, and I'm sure you were pretty devastated by it. But given your breed, I highly doubt it was a predatory thing. Um, I think it was just a group because you have it was three dogs. It was a pack thing more than a. So I can't uh, see the questions. What so was it, the question? I'll read it. So okay. I can but, read it, Nancy. Again, Okay. Okay. I have three. Clumbers. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I have three clumbers, sixty to ninety pounds. They are awesome with people. My entire property is fenced in for their protection. However, they're incredibly territorial. Last week, my neighbor's one-pound teacup chihuahua wiggled her way through the, between the fence rails to greet quote a uh, question mark the dog. She was found with a broken neck and punctures all over. They were pawing at her on the ground, not eating her. My neighbor's devastated. Is there any way this could have been prevented? <laughs> Go ahead, Nance. <laughs> Take that one. I would say, yeah, I would say what your dogs exhibited was not predatory behavior um, because it was there was no orient stock or anything like that. I think it was a if they're already territorial dogs and that little dog made her way in there, um, it, it was just a it was a pack mentality thing. Um, the only way you could have prevented that is not to have been a, that dog. That owner should have been out with that dog where they couldn't um, get over there, get oh, to the fence. There's no way you're not going to have an altercation. And I think the big, the reason it ended in such tragedy is because of the size differential of the dogs, yeah. quite honestly. Yeah. It was the size differential that caused the, it to be a tragic situation because I, I would, I would, guarantee if another larger dog got into that uh into your yard there would have been an altercation mm -hmm. maybe it wouldn't have ended that way because of maybe if they were the same size but your three dogs are a pack and right. they're going to defend their their territory and that's that so um the only way to have prevented that is to make sure that that dog could not get in to your yard and make sure that the dog can never get in there um and uh so that means a couple of things that if, if you already found the dog uh, deceased when you got out there and the handler the owner didn't know it was gone probably they sh you know they let the dog out and you know let her so the only way to prevent to have prevented that is to not uh, hopefully not allow the dog to come over and i know this is probably going to strain the relationship between you and your neighbor but going forward if they decide to get another dog making sure that nobody can get in your yard would be the best way to protect Chicken that. Hunts. And I bet, yeah, and I think it's a, it was a pack thing. It wasn't prey because it, 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 that is not a prey situation at all. So, Yeah, we, I know, I had this conversation with Nancy, I think it was last week, where we were talking about living with other animals, like, I, and I'll take just cats, for instance, right? How... You know, her dogs live with cats, and I said, yes, but if a stray cat was in your yard, what do you think would happen, right? And she said, well, I think one of my dogs would be fine with it. I do think the other dog would potentially go after it. You know what I mean? So I, I think situationally, especially when in the backyard, right, it becomes so territorial for those dogs. That's their space. That's their home. Um, you know, they can defend that from other animals, even the same types of animals that might live indoors. Yeah. Yes. You no, know, I know at um, at the shelter, one of the common questions we had we get is, do you know if this dog is okay with cats? Uh, no, I don't. And I don't know how to test without actually um, using a cat. Right. And I don't think it's fair. So I've thought of different ways, like having a crate and then having cat smell to see how the dog's predatory sequence looks but you're missing something anyway because cats run right when they're scared so they take off well that's usually when the dogs are going to be more um 
um, more um, inclined to chase it and grab and continue the prey sequence as far as they'll go. But I think um, right. I think that it's hard to know for sure. And we do like they'll allow them to take them home, whatever, for a couple of days and see how things go. If they have cats, basically, you know, I tell them keep the have the cats the ability to move away from the dog, watch the dog, keep it on a leash, watch for stalking or eye, really heavy eye contact. Um, and that's that is what we want to, you know, pay attention to. And um, you know, and then see if the dog can split attention. So I think too, the really important thing is that if the dog can't split attention, I'm less apt to say that's an appropriate dog for a cat home, right? I want them right. to be able to split. Even if the cat's just sitting there, or even if the cat is at a distance and running, if you can't get attention, that's concerning to me. So um, anyway, that's that's my- Yeah, concern. well, and, and, and I'll be honest, my, my uh, shepherd, uh, chases the cats but he w chases them to love them uh and they hate that <laughs> so right so uh and i and it is a concern and this goes back to ali's situation it's a size differential yes right he's not going to harm them but he's big my shepherd is 98 pounds uh but my cats are very smart and very savvy on how to get away from him um and they do cuddle when he's lying down but when he's running around they stay they, they, and they do correct him. They're very, uh, my cats are pretty thug cats. They will correct that dog. So usually he's pretty good about not hurting them, but he does have a little more predation. Uh, my shepherd, my, my young shepherd now, he does have the orients. He'll stalk, he'll does a little crouching, um, and he'll love, and he loves to chase and, 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 and that. The only thing, luckily, uh, even though he's a shepherd, he will not, uh, grab it, bite it, and shake it or anything like that. So mm -hmm. thank goodness uh, that was kind of genetically modified for his in his line. So that was a good thing. Nice. Um, yeah. Kim, who was it? Uh, Deb, how do you teach self-control to overcome a dog's instinct? We're coming to that. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we're getting there. Yeah. I think, right, how do you how do you channel that dog's prey drive, right? So what what kind of drive are they showing? Are they showing you the eye? Are they showing you stalking, chasing, um, you know, kind of that shake and kill type of thing? So those are all those are all things that you'll want to think of, right? So as it says here, right, if hurting and retrieving breeds that want, you know, moving things or to bring things back, balls or frisbees, you know, chasing fetch games are are could sometimes be just enough for them. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I think the, the digging right for terriers, sometimes that's a great way to, you know, get in there and, and try and use those feet to dig out things like what they were meant to do. Right. Rats, weasels, all of those types of things. So earth dog and barn hunt, getting them into some sports. Right. Um, sporting breeds. Because you're really well in those words. Oop, Go ahead. Yeah. And you say she, yeah, with the, and with going back to the barn hunt, for those terriers, that's why terriers really do well in barn mm -hmm. hunt, because they satiate that desire to stop prey, and they can be a little bit rough with the tubes, but they're really, I mean, they satiate. That's what you're really doing. You're not eliminating or stopping the behavior. You're satiating that desire uh, and that predatory sequence so that they're happier and they can, you know, and they can... Uh, uh, you know, it reminds me. You know, it reminds me. I know it's a very old movie uh, with uh, Daryl Hannah. It's a, it's called Splash, yes. where she was a mermaid, and when she was in the city, she needed to get in the water with salt to alleviate her desire to be a mermaid, right, in the city. So it's the same thing. You need to be able to provide the dog an, a way to do those behaviors in a more constructive way. Uh, in, in their in their lives with us right so yep and what i find interesting too is some of those dogs that really do like the the stocky stuff even trying them in barn hunt i tried one of my dogs and as you know when you're teasing with the tube she's all about it and then as soon as the tube stops moving she's like eh. right so that didn't didn't give her it didn't it didn't focus on the movement piece that she right. needed so much right so that's why there's a right. lot of different things to try Right. So, and that's what I mean that uh, Joanne, because she's a border collie, not a terrier. For the terriers, right. 
The barn hunt usually is enough. Sure. The border collie needs the chase part. Yep. It. Where the yep. terrier doesn't doesn't tech doesn't theoretically need that chasing. They just he just needs orient. He needs to see it and then go in. We go right. in. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. So no there's problem. not no, no, no questions. Right. Right. Where the border collie, the reason why her her predatory sequence is a little less desirable, there is still chase in there, which is part of her DNA, right? Right. Even though she has the kill piece, we don't want her to do that. What? So, um, no, we don't. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Stone uh, asks a question or kind of has a remark here. It seems that for most pet owners, seeking a purebred dog from confirmation lines is advantageous. Um, in the U.S., we tend to Americanize dogs, seeking a dog that shows some breed tendencies but will fit in the average household with average coming and goings. Agree or disagree? I think it depends on the breeder you're pulling from, right? Yep. yep. Lines, because there are some it's lines. Pure, it, Go ahead. Yeah, but it's very, it's, but I think, Lisa, in Border Collies and some of the herding breeds, if you pull from confirmation, they, they have a lot less of that. You know, also, what was also interesting they say the gamier dogs are more are less um have less bone density do you guys hear that before it was so fascinating when i heard that and they actually did a study about it because um well if you, if, if you look at labs that's true uh -huh. <laughs> right <laughs> very interesting so those dogs are more excitable and so forth so they have the smaller frame yeah than that. it's very interesting so the bigger dogs, they can't expend as much energy. So if you look at out in nature, how they are, right? They're not going to be this big fat thing that comes out to attack. They won't be able to get to them or whatever. They're going to be this little narrow thing. So they'll be like, come on, guys, let's go get them. So they're all going to be pretty athletic that way. So I think um, yeah. it's interesting that you bring that up, Dave, because, um, you know, I mean, I've looked at different kinds of breeds myself and, um, cause I, I just like different, whatever. And, um, it's interesting because, um, I remember Nancy was telling me, cause I was looking at some of the Malinois and stuff and, you know, just looking around, trying to get a feel for it. But it does seem that the more, uh, the bulkier dogs are more docile, um, rather than the more slender dogs, which is interesting right. because like in, in, like in some of the, um, what is it? Like the, the bite, bite club, uh, bite club, bite sports they want some of the more bigger, bulkier dogs, which is interesting because I'm like, but it kind of contradicts some of the things they have to do and so forth. But, you know, I, I'm not a bite sport person. I don't, don't proclaim to be, but um, I wouldn't be doing that. I just want a pet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, well, but I think, I, but I think Dave is onto something here. Mm -hmm. I do think, because it's true in the labs, uh, the labs that are confirmation uh, labs, <laughs> they've never, they they could never go get a bird. They have they need a, a, a they need a break in between. Most of them would have a hard time because right. they're so they're so big. Where the more field ones are sleeker. It's not as Lisa said and Joanne can jump in. And Vishlas, that's not really uh, it, it is somewhat. But some of this it depends on the breeds. Some of the you really have to look at it. But I would agree that well, border collies the the more. The more uh, uh, confirmation border collies don't, they're not as, they don't have as much of the issues that some of the more uh, working line border collies have, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now I will tell you, this is just my experience in the pointing breeds, right? The more birdie they are, like the more, <clears throat> I'm talking these true dogs that will go out and just and hunt, 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 hunt. I, I have found them less tolerable of, of other dogs. I'm not saying they can't go out on a brace, but right they're they're a little sharper than they're more, more so excitable, they, more aroused. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, which can turn a little more into that over arousal, getting a little more into aggressive tendencies, right? Um, which again, in a sporting breed, not really supposed to be right. They're supposed to be able to tolerate other animals pretty darn well, right? Um, so. Yeah. It's, I, I think you can have, as soon as you start messing with what do you really want, right? Do you want that higher arousal? That comes with its own cup of tea, right? So I, I, I think it depends because even in confirmation lines, right? You, 
you can have breeders that are that are still out there preserving a lot of old world trying not to make a difference right in what they were versus what they are now and then you have some who are you know i want to go to the dog of the year and i i really want to breed for the confirmation ring and it's you know sometimes if we lose that form and function versus what's going to win in the show ring mm -hmm. you know it just depends there are lines you know there are breeders out there that have lines of every type so i think you can you can find a confirmation lab that you know still can go out into the hunting field they exist right you can find i think we're just sort of talking sometimes in generalities here so not that they yeah, don't yeah. exist right but um again when you're starting to breed sometimes for a look of an animal there's so many scientific studies that go back to say when you breed for one thing you're gonna get other things whether or not you want them right well it's like yep. ray coppinger's um ray coppinger's yes. mo like the mobile right if you pull on one piece the rest follow so yep. you can't affect right. one piece it would be amazing and fantastic <laughs> if we could but we're not that good guys so um nature has yeah. her own ideas and things go hand in hand, right? So um, like for the hairless types of breeds, I'm thinking the Chinese crested, right? They're closely, their skin coats, their ability to have a coat is quite, uh, very closely aligned with teeth. So their teeth, the formation is very different. So genetics is like some crazy thing that it's, you can understand and they affect each other so much. Like if you try to mute this, then you get this. It's very interesting. But um, the other thing was interesting that I was looking at and they were talking about was um, for like gun dogs are pretty cool. So um, the, the golden retrievers fall into that. They were doing a study between um, people and the golden retrievers it was called um, William Barr syndrome or something like that. So basically it's neonatology. So basically what they're doing is they're trying to build for these very Peter Pan um, behaviors, like they never grow up and um, hype excitability and so forth. Vishless fall in that group, the gun group. Um, and so it was very fascinating because anytime you try to, they, like we wanted super over sociability, hence why we have golden retrievers, right? Which things are changing now because we're putting our hands in it and now we're getting some crazy stuff like i'm seeing more resource guarding in the breed unfortunately and stuff like that um or super sensitive almost like hypersensitivity to novel stimulus in, in sometimes but it's just very interesting how they all do affect one another um and you can't really select for one thing i mean i know when we bred um, my dog fling um the male was not the male we bred to was a smaller male because you wanted to size down and he was not related to anybody with her and remember too when you line breed you're bringing out some stuff that was hidden way back and it's going to come back on but anyway um so we bred this litter and i was not very happy with the litter because i thought fling sociability would come through and it really didn't so then i kept ivy and <laughs> You know, she's not the most sociable. I adore her and I've put a lot of work into it, but I, I kind of, you know, and I wasn't happy. Like I went away and came back and she's like, who are you alarm barking at me? And I'm like, oh, why did I do that? So, you know, but then I put, I worked her, worked her, developed a really strong relationship with her. And that can help a lot with mitigating some of these instincts or desires and so forth. I think though prey drive is really a na is nature's call type of thing. It's not something that we can really affect or change. So um, we can, I know we can, I, we can, we can, right. we can, we can help, help the dogs uh, work it, but it doesn't go away. Is basically right. which right. you know what I mean. Uh, hey, uh, Missy asked about the pit bulls fall in the terrier family. Yep. Yep. So. Yes. I guess, I guess, uh, you know, so it's kind of crazy because I was looking at this and um, so Dr. I told the other, uh, I told both um, Joanne and Nancy about it. Dr. Kim Brophy has a book out called Meet Your Dog. You're not gonna be able to get it because it's out of print now. So they're trying to get more in and so forth. But she breaks down the groups into different things. And the, the terriers fall, there's a terrier section, but there's also a bulldog section. And the difference with the bulldogs is they have um, 
like people commonly label issues with predatory aggression, but not at all, or um, it can either not exist or exist because of the types of dogs that were bred into this category. And remember the, um, the American, so they have the alfalfa, uh, Blue Blood, Blue Dog, American Bulldog, Staffy Terrier, Bull Mastiff, Bull Terrier, Doggo, English Bulldog, French Dog. So they pit Bull Terriers in this group as well as a Bulldog breed. So I guess um, if you're talking about AKC and how they classify it, or if you're talking about what the dog was actually used for initially. So initially these dogs were utilized to take down Bull, right? That's why they call them the bulldog here. This is the bulldog thing. But when they take the bulls down, what happened was, and it was kind of interesting. I was listening to this before we came on. Um, so the bulldogs were designed to do that. And then what happened was the England, I guess, outlawed it, either outlawed the bulls or the, um, cause they went, then they went to cat cattle or um, male, what's your, whatever you call them. And then, then they outlawed that and then they took it underground and they couldn't necessarily get, you know, those big creatures underground because it was forbidden. So then they started fighting dogs against each other. Right. So blood sport, unfortunately, became um, kind of uh, America, some of people's interest. And that's how we got those particular breeds, because all they were doing was they the terrier part. Remember, with your terrier predation, you know, you have the eye, you know, the uh, the orient. And then they emit the whole stalking type of behavior, eye stalking behavior, and go right to jumping in to deal with it. And then, oh, and intrinsically, because they're bred to do that, they are, um, their dopamine, all that stuff comes in and they're like, yeah. And then afterward, you notice they're kind of glazed over. They don't, they're like not really there and they're not thinking. They're like, oh yeah, I don't know what just happened. That was crazy but they have that kind of high. It's, it's very fascinating to kind of understand that. But I think there's some terrier components to it, but they, the pit, bull, pit bulls actually fall under the bulldog group. Sorry, right. but and that's what, so yeah. So, um, so let's get to a little bit on how to help people with that. So uh, like Joanne said, first thing is management correction. The next thing is, self-control right yes you have to teach your dog how to have some self-control around and that's where lisa was talking about splitting their attention can they look at that and, and and be able to control themselves and this is where you start with little small doses if the dog is losing his mind it's too, it's too much so you have to start in small doses so um i a friend of mine um her name is chelsea marie she has a and male malamutes tend to have a little more prey drive um so she got a, a like a life life cat and just walking it and then just taught her dog to come away from it a, a fake cat and because you could see in the beginning the minute he saw it from a distance he totally was like locked and loaded on it so it's one of those things so that's one way is how to call him away from a distance where you can control the situation right um yeah. Yeah, for Anything movement else, stuff, I, I know um, <clears throat> one one really great one that somebody had told me once, um, and you can you can make a really long line from fishing line, and you can either have like a little stuffed toy or a plastic bag or a little piece of fur, right? If you thread that around a tree or a pole or something and tie it together so you have, in essence, a really big, long pulley, um, you can be all the way back at your door, right? And have that threaded all the way to the back of the yard and you can control that, mm -hmm. right? Kind of one hand in the dog's leash and one hand on the, let's call it a lure, right? So mm -hmm. you could be, as long as the fishing line allows you to be away, right? The dog doesn't see the fishing line, it just sees the movement on the line. Um, and then that way you can sort of work from a really great distance um, for the movement dogs, right? Sure. Right. And she means she means uh, getting them where you're far enough away where they can split their attention. Right. And, and again, the movement would have to be very small mm -hmm. and short, a little bit. Right. So they can get their attention. And again, we're not making the behavior go away. We're just teaching them some putting some controls around it. OK, so really important to understand that difference. We're not making the prey drive go away. We're just putting some controls on it. Right. And. 
if you remember a few weeks ago when Lisa was working with the, the shelter dog that got very, very over aroused playing tug, right? When you're playing a game like tug, that's why it's super important for the toy to die, right? Mm -hmm. So you stop right. pulling back on that toy um, and right, it, it, it's, it stops being alive. So as soon as it, it dies, it has no more movement. It, it becomes less interesting to the dog. So those are, you know, that's something you can definitely do if your dog gets really excited playing things like tug. Yeah. And, and you can use tug for those dogs that enjoy playing that to put a lot of control on it. Right. right? And what we tend to do though, is play too long yes. and too much and get the dogs over aroused. So like, like Joanne said, you can play a little bit and you're going to put some controls on it and not make the dog crazy about it. Cause I think that's where tugging got a bad reputation mm -hmm. and it's because we can't stop ourselves either. We also need to have self control around it. Right. Right. And remember you're not, again, I think the important thing is you can't suppress behavior. Behavior will manifest itself in multiple ways. And I think this is what, like, um, what, Nancy was alluding to in terms of don't play tug. And some people are like, oh, I heard if you play tug, you increase aggression. I'm like, no, not really. Actually, for example, um, with all the mud season everybody's having right now, which is my most favorite time of the year, um, my border collie comes in and then he sits and I have a towel and he's like, okay, I'm sitting. And he offers the behavior and he's like, you could see him. He's like, I'm so excited because I know what's coming next. So I take the towel and I wipe his paw and then he looks at me and I wait the other paw. I was going to get video of this. I completely forgot. And then I'm like, stand. And he stands and I wipe his other paw, his fourth paw. And then I'm, he sits back down and he waits for me and I hold it. And I'm like, okay, get it. So then we play tug, tug, tug. I release, have him release it. And then um, we might play a little bit again. Then I stop. And then I'm like, okay, we're all done. And I put it away. And he's like, oh, okay, game's over. That was fun. But you were able to control that. So that input, that self-control. And I think there was another... Um, Margaret did it, Margaret Simic. She was telling us about, remember Nancy was telling us about there was a little terrier that she had. I forgot the name of the terrier. I think it was Maggie or something. Mm. And she had her sit um, and she had a flirt pole and she was moving it around and, oh, you can want this. You have to stay. And she was really good at it. And then she was like, okay, get it. And so then the, the dog was like, and had really good stays for obedience, right? So you know, you have right. to think about how you can um, have your dog be thoughtful under those situations, especially when they're controlled situations, right? So um, other things that you could do too is, um, you know, I, I'm big on the whole, um, I'm big on eye, eye contact and then also having distance away from distractions using your stimulus gradient whereby um, my distance is further away and say, let's say I have a dog who's interested in motion and so forth and there's somebody playing fetch with their dog in a yard or whatever. I'm gonna go as far away as possible and see if I can get some of that, that attention from the dog and say, can you control yourself and say, hey, I'd like to do that. And you can utilize toys as well, but I think you have to be careful with that arousal tip, right? Because I think it can almost um, increase arousal depending on who the dog is and how you're trying to manage it. There's so many components that go into this. And, um, you know, as, as we all know, it's not just, it's what the dog has learned. It's what their environment is. It's who they are. And then it's who their genes are. So it's a combination of so many things that you have to consider and adjust. And that's why to me and to all of us, all three of us, training is not a one size fits all. You have to know who your dog is and how to manipulate or not manipulate, help them understand what it is you ultimately want. So, right. Yeah. Uh, Kim asked what chihuahuas were, ch chihuahuas were a mix of, uh, they were part rat or is that why they can be little tenacious little things. Um, right, chihuahuas are a mix of, um, I thought that I chihuahuas remember. were just on the toys. I thought they were too. Yeah. 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 But uh, they were they're also yeah, used, yeah. they were used as bed warmers, right? Flea magnets, by the way. Um, and Ew. yeah, right? Bed warmers and then alarm alarmists. Someone's coming in the house. Oh well, yeah. Shocking. Yep. Right? Yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but yeah, they And most of those toy books. 
Yeah, most of those toy breeds or smaller dogs are used were used for alert, you know, alerting, um, you know, alert barkers, and which is why they they do a lot of it. So it's really right. Um, so the other thing is um, uh, the other thing is having a really really good recall on your dog. So again, you need to work on it at nauseum and be so that your dog can come off of anything. So if they, they I, so one of the ways to replicate the prey drive is um, I usually, if I can call my dog out of play, with, if they're playing with another dog and I can call them out of play um, in that state, a lot of times they should be able to come off of prey um, as long as you catch it early enough. If they are full blown, full tilt going after prey, they're gone. I mean, yeah, they're too late. You know, you're, it's going to be tougher. And I but too, if you can, go ahead. I'm sorry. Because I think you can, um, you can if you have a rock solid recall or an emergency recall, right? Like this means come here right now. That is, instead of just a regular come. Again, it's not foolproof. And like Joanne said, it's all of these things together that will help you with your predator, prey, you know, prey driven dog. It's not one or the other. If you don't have the self control, your your recall is not going to be really worth too much because they're not going to be able to do it. And you know, some people will use like shock collars for corrections and stuff like that. And here's the thing: once your dog is in that high state of arousal, getting that dopamine fix and all that, and adrenaline rush, you're done. You have nothing. There, this is why when some dogs, they go in and they're in the midst of a, a pretty serious discussion, right? I mean, they're all in. You can't break it up because they're gone. You And people will like, I mean, we saw Michael Shikashio showed about that one street fight between the two dogs. Yeah. yeah. People were kicking the dog and beating it with they things. They a taser. Like, they a tased taser. that dog like five times. It wouldn't come off. It was, so it was gone. Right. There was nothing more. I mean, there's other ways to break up a fight, which maybe we'll talk about at some point or have somebody come on and talk about it. But um, um, at that point, it was done. There was more. You had to like yeah. it, you had to physically manipulate the dog in a specific way to do it. But, you know, when you're at that point, forget it. I've seen dogs like work through corrections like some people. In the, and I think it's also important to mention that there are various ways to utilize e-collars. So, but most people use goes to the punishment aspect because it makes sense, right, to them. Like, oh, it's a correction, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, there's other ways that people utilize it in yeah, because, different manners, but because in, that, in that case is gone. Yeah, in that situation, you're adrenalizing the dog. So you're actually making the situation much, much worse. Yep. Um, because it's, you're, you're, you know, it's dumping adrenaline, the more, the more you, try to stop it or you know taser and all that other stuff you're journalizing the dog more so and, uh, right. it's a it's a tough thing yeah so um, have uh, you done pre-mac for recalls right guys have you done pre-mac yes yeah. pre-mac principle actually could you go over what that is elisa but yeah we that's the pre-mac is what i use mostly for my recalls because um it's I I have over the years have found it to be the most effective way, so uh, to get a decent recall because that's very important to me. Mm -hmm. uh, my dog coming back when I call it. So, go ahead. How, how have you used it? Have you used it, Joanne? Pre Mac principle? How have you talked? So what? Or go. I'm sorry, so you. <laughs> yeah. So I I usually like if they come to me. They can have what, uh, you know, what they want, like, like uh, in Tango's case, if he comes to me, he can go get his ball because that's what he really wants. And it, it was difficult in the beginning. I had to put the ball in something else so that he wouldn't be able to reinforce himself. So if he came to me, then we both went and he was able to get his ball. Um, and then he quickly figured that out really fast. My lab... It was a little easier. It didn't need to use pre mac as much with her because she figured out if she comes, she gets a cookie. Life is good, so it wasn't as much of a problem. But for my shepherd, if he was chasing something, I'd have to make it worth his while to, to come. You know what I mean? Off of off of a very ex exciting environment, if he was in a very exciting environment. So I wanted him to be able to come out of play, which is very difficult for him. 
So that's kind of how we worked it, using the ball and the pre-mac and all that, so you could do that. Right. Joanne, yeah. what have you done? Have you done uh, pre-mac? Uh, not really. Um, you know, I mostly, and again, every dog's different, but I've had the most success with the, the chase me kind of games, right? Where um, it's natural for most dogs. They, if their owner's moving away, they want to go see them, right? And just trying to minimize the distractions and then paying the heck out of that. Um, but again, I mean, that's, you're talking, what do I teach in beginning obedience, right? I mean, if you want to move on from that, um, yeah, it's, it, I, I mean, to me, it's just, you can't go slow enough with that stuff, right? Let me add this in, let me add that in, let me add, you know, and, and really you have to find what is rewarding for the dog, right? If it, if it's food, yay for you. If it's, you know, the ball, absolutely use whatever. So what do you do, Lisa? Yeah, well, because... Because sorry, Tango will, I because Tango I worked on recalls when he was like that in the beginning to chase me, but if he was on something else, he wasn't going to come to me mm -hmm. um, as reliably as the reliable the reliability I want. I want you to come away. I don't care what's happening. You must come to me, and so I had to add in that extra pre mac where I gave him something he really wanted, and he had to come to me to get it because otherwise. He'd still be, he'd make a bad choice. <laughs> and I didn't want him practicing, not coming to me, so. I mean, I think you can use, there's so many different things, right? So my recalls, the runaway recall, like Joanne's kind of talking about, that's a big one in like fly ball because they're using, you know, fly ball's a giant game of chase. Um, and they build a tons of like, it's a really good sport for recall. Um, it's not so great on their some of their wrists, depending on how you train um, your box turn and stuff. I was fortunate enough to have somebody who was pretty incredible um, at teaching. Her name was Susan Cleveland, and um, she did a great job with teaching safe box turns. Although it's still a pressure like anything else, like agility on body, right? So um, other things you can do your recall where you do the hide and seek thing where you go somebody holds your dog, you go hide and they find you type of thing in a big party happens um the pre-mac principle um trying to think who i've used it on um most of my dogs i'm pretty good at making them pretty dependent on me <laughs> which is good yeah. yet bad right i mean because they're like yeah. Mommy. i so, mean it, it, it so just the pre-mac principle for those for those people who don't know in plain plain english is basically if you do this if you come to me you will be able to get this what you want so for example, back in the day, Lisa and I would be, you come to me and then you can go get, you could go meet people or get a treat from somebody else. So you do this and then you get this. That's what the pre-mac means, right? Um, so it's it's in plain English. So you can use it for a lot of stuff, but uh, that's one way to do it. And for, and so it goes back to, if you have a, like, Margaret with Maggie, if you stay, because, you know, she wants to chase that blood pole, right. if you stay, then you'll be able to get it, right? Um, so, and, and as, a, as a reinforcer. So, it, and it, again, it depends on what your dog finds pleasurable and, you know, right. what they want it, what they, what they, what they so, find important and they, what they want, right? There was another one. So, um, there was one other trainer who had talked about she had a dog who liked to hunt rabbits. So what she did was she taught, she had the dog, she'd say here for the dog to come to her and she'd point out the rabbit track and then the dog's like, oh my gosh, that's useful information. Let me just, you know, you totally know. So I'm going to follow you. So that's also a form of pre-mac as well. Um, but, you know, think yeah. about things like that. I mean, it's really, it's a really good tool. I use it for other things as well. It's like you come to me and sit and then you can greet somebody or you may or may not get to say hi but you build it really important that they do that first and then you start to control or start to help them right. the, the outcome i i think it's right. so hard for for that to be a thing because people want to stop the dog from getting what they want because usually it's conflict right. right right so i i had the my best success with that was a nose work dog is she was a vishla birdie 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 like if we did exteriors that was my dog, right? Like, <laughs> so I remember I had to do like two steps and it was a, just a crap ton of odor. And as soon as she would find it and first time it took us like five minutes, right? And she found that and I cut her off leash and went, go get the bird, right? Mm -hmm. And then she was like, oh, that's right? awesome. It was like two or three times and she's like, no problem. I got it now, right? It, it, 
it was that quick of a click for her. But again, what what do we find most of the time, right? Like, well, no, I don't want her to get the birds. I want her to find stuff. Well, you know, look how much faster it worked when I gave her what she wanted after she did what I wanted. Mm -hmm. So, right. And and I was just, as a matter of fact, I was just talking to um, one of the detection handlers. He had a Malinois that wasn't really interested in the t in the in the toy, the reinforcement, the toy reward that they use for finding order, he really wanted to bite. He likes biting, and that's what he enjoyed. So what they ended up doing, which is against what they usually do, right? Normally, they want the dog to stay at the source and, uh, you know, stay there. But this dog wasn't, the reinforcement wasn't working. The food would fall and toy, and he wouldn't care about it. So they ended up marking the behavior and then letting him play tug, mm. which is... He got to do what he wanted, which was bite. So he got the toy to bite and changed changed the dog's perspective. So um, that's what I mean. With prey drive, could be very could be very distressing for people and working with it. But you can learn how to uh, where everybody gets what they want and be, and be happy. Because the big thing is you manage it. You find an outlet for it. You put some control on it, and then you teach a recall. And life would get a little simpler for for uh, for anybody that has a dog with a lot of prey drive. Um, so it's one of those, and it, again, it's, nothing is perfect, um, but you definitely want to be able to, because a lot of times when you give the dog the outlet for whatever behavior, it's really helpful because then you satiate it and then it doesn't, like Lisa said, it doesn't come out elsewhere, right? You've taken care of that desire for the dog or that need for the dog to do that. Um, so, and I want to be clear, too, that just because your dog likes to chase things doesn't mean it's predatory. Predatory is very specific. It's a more orient, it's slow, and it's quiet. A lot of, if they're stalking to kill something, they're not going to make a lot of noise. They're just not. So just be aware that just because your dog likes to chase stuff doesn't mean he's predatory at all it's a different it's a definite look to it and a different thing that it should look like um so before you think oh my god my dog has a lot of prey drive dog may not well, may do your dog may just like to chase stuff you know what i mean do you want to do you want to see the videos just of the yeah. quick little video differences oh did we lose everybody nope i'm still here oh. Nance, oh, I'm still sure. maybe cut out Oh, there she is. Yep. Sorry. Okay. So I just took some quick three little videos here and um, I just, I'll show them real quick just so you guys can sort of see. Um, let me make sure I got the right. And remember um, when you're, when dogs are actually doing prey drive or to kill or hunt or something like that, um, remember the economy of movement. So meaning that if they're out in the, in the wild, loosey goosey jumping around, hello, I'm gonna come kill you is not typical of going to take it, take out game, right? So pay attention to body language of dogs when you are doing this. Um, I remember while she's getting this up, there was a dog that, um, that I was assessing that I had concerns about actually wanting to arm another dog and we videotaped it. This dog was in predatory stalking mode. I stalk at about from another dog about 50 feet away. And um, it didn't, yeah, that was, I was like, oh, that's too much, too much. And so of course that particular dog, as I found out later, had had gotten out and tried to injure neighborhood dogs, actually climb fences to get out. Um, so that was a very scary situation. Um, but anyway, yeah. now we move on to this. It's all right. You can see this, right? Yep. All right. So uh, this is, again, this is not real. It's just a just a generic setup. So you can sort of like giggle a little bit and see. So we have this, it's a very realistic looking bunny in real, real life. So first you have the bird dog, right? <laughs> Watson. Okay. Oh. It's not alive. I don't care. Right. He just is like, whatever. So that's really... If it was alive, I would expect him to freeze, right? And say, hey, what is that? Right. So, gotta love He Noah. quickly assessed at a distance that it was nothing. He's like, no, not a rabbit. 100%, right? I mean, he's, he comes in like, oh, what is that? And then he's like, oh, 
never mind. Yeah, you could tell mid stride as he's like, oh, never mind. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So then this is, I think, one of the ones where people get most confused because what you're going to see, right? I love the Dobermans. This is what looks like. <laughs> This is what looks like the attack and kill, right? But what I want you to focus on the whole time is the the body language, right? Watch how soft his body is. He would not survive in the wild. No. No. Oh my god, I gotta get it. <laughs> you totally wouldn't. Right? And you totally. get a lot of that shake, shake and kill stuff, right? But look at and bouncy. Me. He's not serious. No, he's very soft. He's very curved. Right. And then in the end, of course, he's like, eh, bye. Right? Okay. <laughs> it's much more sure. toy related, right? Right. So these are the two contrasts that I wanted to show you. <clears throat> so Porter Collie, you should get a little stalking. She's like, ah, that's stupid. Right? Yeah. So she she picks no it motion. up, she's like, not real. Okay, and so, right, she's, she's she's done with that. Now, if we said, oh, we tested her with a bunny, she's not predatory at all, right? No stalking behavior, nothing. She's just an easygoing border collie, okay? So then if we pause this right off the bat, I want you to see that. Mouth is closed. Yeah, we'll look at the eyes. Totally. Every, yeah. Orient, right? Yep. Everything is oriented to that ball. This goes quick, but this is what a stalk is. Yep. <gasps> she wanted right. to get to the chase right away. She's like, right chase. away. Yep. Right. She's like, no time for stalking. Have you ever put it on sheep? So if you if you know this dog, that falling would would have made her jump. Right? So look at all of this orientation and the, not really what you want in a border collie, but. <laughs> no. <laughs> have you put her on sheep too, Anne? Have you I put have. her on sheep? I actually have. She's pretty good she on look? sheep. She gets a little over aroused and she'll grip just a little, but surprisingly when it's a sheep, right? Well, they don't move as fast as that ball though too. They He's like, do getting not. away, must grab it. Sure. Right, they do not. And this is a little more of a stalk, I think. Oh, wow. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see that a little bit. There. Boom, done. But when right. we talk about that eye, guys, right? Look at the ears are forward. The body is, look at how everything is tense. That eye is directly towards the object, right? So the bunny didn't care. This moves. Right? So the difference in behavior that you saw, right, from the bunny just sitting there to that ball, that shows you a completely different type of behavior. So if you're looking, like, say, at a rescue dog or whatever, and you want to check that out, be sure to do it with, you know, mimic things and movement things. And it, it just really, it's still not going to give you 100%. But if you get it with the stuffed kitty, you're, you're very yeah. much less than going to get it with the real one, right? Well, and, and one thing to keep in mind, too, I mean, with the rescue, remember there's different types of rescue, and I have to speak to this because I don't think people quite understand. Um, and it's near and dear to my heart um, for obvious reasons. But um, there's a difference between foster-based rescue and um, brick-and-mortar places, okay? And then there's a difference between privately owned rescues and um, government-run facilities, so there, there are many different resources available for um, government resource, uh, government situations, and then privately owned rescues are usually funded by whomever donates, what have you. So um, I think like it's hard to know 100% if you are seeing, unless it's an exaggerated behavior, I think you're gonna see those big changes um, in, in a, a brick and mortar type of rescue or shelter. Um, so, you know, if we, if they see it, they'll probably identify it, hopefully. But um, I think from a foster point of view, if you're worried about cats or what have you, I would look at a foster based rescue who might give you, be able to give you more information about a dog 
within a home because you're not going to get a good 100% um, yeah, read. Read, on read on any dog in, in an actual brick and mortar building. It's really, it's really challenging. So. Right. And you might and you might want to and you might have a cat because for me before I didn't have cats, so it didn't matter. But now that I do have cats, it does matter who comes in my house and all that. And while my cats are very dog savvy, um, you know, it still, you know, they, they, it, it still puts them at risk. Right. Whatever dog I bring in my house and things like that, I have to be more thoughtful about it because it matters more now. So, um and, and that's why, and I, I'm glad Joanne showed the video because it really does show, like, like predat predation is a very specific thing. So if you want, if you look at it, like predation is for, 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 you know, survival and aggression is more social. So those are the two differences in those two things. And so when you're looking at it, that's what it should be. You know that's what you should be thinking about because a lot of dogs just like to chase stuff there is no predatory they just enjoy it just part of who they like my lab has very little prey drive she just likes chasing stuff and running and she doesn't she's not gonna she doesn't do any stalking or anything like that she'll play do that and play but she's not typically not part of her how, who she is so she doesn't have that much of that so mm -hmm. yeah real similar to bam right real similar to the doberman where it's it's i'm gonna get it i'm gonna shake it i'm gonna have a good time with it but it's you know it's when i'm done with it i'm done with it i don't really want to kill it yeah right very playful right so dave had a question could you guys read that yeah yeah the sheep bred border collies are a lot different than the cattle bred border collies behaviorally cattle bred ones are more inclined to grab at a nose or a heel can you dissect in the sequence of the differences we see in the two types um yeah you know i mean really that's genetically built in right so it's where the cattle dogs came from right and that's where if anybody has met a corgi oh yep wow like Corgis were classically cattle herders, right? And I know, Dave, you were asking about BCs, but when you go into the the true cattle herding, herding dogs, corgis yeah, and, and 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 uh, kelpies and right um, the the cattle dogs, man, those are tough, tough, tough dogs, right? They can take right. a lot. And, yeah, and chances are, chances are, the way they have border collies that use that are used for cattle. Is they use them they took the ones that were a little more grippy to then breed to make the ones that they can use for cows right that's kind of how how it works if you yeah. were to break if you were to break down behaviorally the difference though right so the cattle dogs are going to be more um go into social pressure right yes. and the difference with the with the regular you know the regular i should say the other bcs that are used to herd sheep and stuff they're more off of it right so they have a lot more space and they're moving more with the eye versus going in on that right. just like the aussies too they do that aussie boink or whatever and jump up and grab the nose they're also used for cattle as well um but think about what they're designed to do and where in the prey sequence the dog so at the grab bite it's probably a pretty nice you know they're going to go in so they probably muted some of the other stuff beforehand go in grab bite and then to move the cattle and so forth so that releases the that's the releasing stimulus for that right with the dopamine and everything right yeah. yep very yeah. cool right and i mean the reason behind that is when you think of the just the sheer size of the animal right sheep um orient very much to any approach they're prey right i mean cattle sort of but not in the you know they haven't been prey in the u.s outside of humans for a long time right so you know but yeah, the right. sheep are classically on alert right so when they read that's where that low stocky eye comes from and that border collie is orienting right towards them the sheep are like oh crap right and most of the time that's when they bunch together that's when they'll move as one because they're you know just that just that little walk up with that eye, they're gone. You stare at a cow and the cow's like, they'll stomp at you, right? Like, get out of here. Yeah. So yep. they need much more of, of that social pressure that Lisa was talking about, right? Because they know they're bigger. Absolutely. Right. And then you have yep. those little, the little um, dachshunds or the little, the little terriers that go in to pull out badgers out of holes. I'm like, wow, that yeah. is insane. But we bred, we selected that. We selected for that because what, for every reason, you know, 
Um, there was obviously a need somewhere, but yeah, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> we've, we've muted that whole like, you know, self-preservation gene to be able to go in and kill this bigger animal than you. So it, it's pretty crazy the things that we've done um, genetically to dogs. So it's kind of sad in a way because yeah. I think they could be a lot more, I don't know, social. Although I also don't think we would have the breeds we would have we have now. Right. I think we would have be a lot variety. more mix mixes. Yeah, and a lot more variety and stuff like that. So it's interesting. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, it's been great. I think we probably if the dog orient stuff so it doesn't kill yeah, it's it is, Sarah, prey, prey drive like that doesn't kill like la like retrievers. They orient, they can, you know, they stalk the retrievers, but they don't kill it. Right. They're not supposed to. Vishlas, uh, golden breeds. Yeah, it's okay. It's good that they don't kill it. It's a good thing. So, yes, it's still prey drive, but they just don't, luckily, they don't kill it. They just have that, that they, there's a stop in that predatory sequence. So, um, and, and you still, and again, for most dogs that don't kill stuff, it's usually not a big deal. Right. It's a big prey drive becomes a problem when the dogs want to kill stuff, right? Uh, <laughs> right, and that's that's where the issue is. But some, you know, my my shepherd stalks and he, he's got prey drive, but he doesn't want to kill anything. So it's not. I don't. I do want. I don't want him chasing anything. Um, and I want and I work the recall, but I know he's not going to kill anything because that's mm -hmm. just not who he is. So the only concern with prey, with a predator, a dog that has prey drive, you want to make sure you he stays, you know, you can get him back and he doesn't chase, go off and chase something else. But yeah, it's still prey drive. You just it, just because they don't kill it doesn't mean that it's not prey drive. So yeah, cool. All right, thank you guys. This was fun. Thanks. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Oh yeah, All next right. week is Easter. Yeah. A happy Easter yep. for you. Happy Easter. Easter. So we won't be here next yep. week. So, Yes. Happy Easter, all. All Take right. Care. Bye, guys. All right. Bye.